or maybe you're watching a recording, which is fantastic. We're happy to be back. So after a week of absence, we are here and with one of our European friends. And the guy that is here today is not only an industry friend, he's also a personal friend, he's from Germany. I will ask him, we will ask him to do a brief intro on himself. But this guy is he's smart, he's on top of his business and he's running a big, big, big international network where he's sharing insights, latest developments. And among those things is, for example, uh, precious metals like gold. So I'm very fortunate and I'm very happy and grateful that my friend Florian accepted the invite. So before we get started, I, I just want to do a, a wrap up because I'm now in the Hague, uh, the Hague area in the Netherlands. I'm in a hotel lobby uh, with a good Wi-Fi, by, by the way, so I'm happy to be here. But Gordon, you're, you're still in LA this week, right? Yeah, no, <laughs> that's a good way to put it. I'm definitely still in LA. I feel like I'm still in LA. Uh, it's 5.30 in the morning here as usual. Hence the dark outside. You, you'll know that I've escaped from Los Angeles when we're doing this show, and it's light outside. Yeah, that that will be your visual cue. Um, I'm here. I'm. I think I may be in Europe in a month, maybe. Um, now Europe, not like EU. Europe, like Turkey or Serbia or something. But we'll 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 see. Um, you know, I'm, I'm like a COVID runner. You know, seeing where around the world I can get from. Los Angeles. I, I got to tell you, after yesterday's presidential debate, um, or unpresidential debate, I'm very motivated to. Yeah, you know, it, it's it's time to it's time to reengage the world, shall we say? You want to you want to come, come over, and we as Europeans, we are welcome you with open arms to come to Europe. We're, we're going to do a nice road show. We can do you know the Crypto Wednesday from different locations whenever, of course, we are able to travel again. I think it would be nice to uh, hook up with, with Florian in Munich, where he's officially lo located. But we can also do a crypto venture show from, let's say, Zug in Crypto Valley. In Switzerland, that would be a nice place. I think Berlin is also a nice place. There are a lot of techies, a lot of oh, blockchain sure. and crypto people in, in Berlin. And of course, not to forget Amsterdam, my hometown. So I think this for the upcoming months, uh, although we need to see you know, whatever is possible on the, on the traveling, we will do a lot of nice things. We will get a lot of good hey, speakers. Meet me in Istanbul. It's a, it's a beautiful city. Yeah. We've been, we been doing a crypto Wednesdays over, you know, overlooking the Bosphorus. Yeah. That would be, be awesome. Istanbul, Istanbul is fantastic. I got, I got several friends, entrepreneurs in Istanbul. They always say, yeah, you need to go to Istanbul. It's like a country in a country. You know, a lot of things going on. Also in blockchain. I've never been there, but I want to go there. Yeah, it's but amazing. Before before we lose the focus for today, because we have. Well, no, I was about to ask Florian: Are the beer gardens open in Munich? That's the key question. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, first of all, hello to to everybody mm -hmm. here in this hall, and especially to the, the two of you. Thanks again, Sandra, for inviting me. Really appreciate it. Sure. And um, yeah, uh, Gordon. Uh, I think they are partially open, but. Uh, you think. Hmm. I actually didn't try it, to be honest. I mean, um, uh, they used to open up in the summertime for sure. And well, obviously people had to keep their distance. So it's not a real beer garden vibe and feeling mm -hmm. uh, during the summer. And now uh, here, especially Munich, seems to slowly but surely become a Corona hotspot. <laughs> so um, uh, I think they're going to do more shutdowns and lockdowns again. Um, not really sure where this all goes, but... Luckily, I'm in the Bavarian countryside, ah. far away from any of those problems, uh, uh, enjoying the nature and the good weather today. I'm here with my family and um, funny, or luckily I can work from home. So uh, I don't need to go anywhere to run my business, which is great. Uh, I'm doing this for actually the last 20 years already. So I saw that. Well, I, I, I'll throw out there, I, I studied in Germany when I was in college in Berlin and Augsburg. So oh, yeah. uh, kind of your neighbor. And I and went to Munich a lot. And I, I have fond memories of Dunkelbroi, you know, and Knesset Gatsa. And, and the, the whole, here. yeah, it's, you know, and big steins of it. <laughs> this is back when I could throw that stuff down without a problem. It was so good. And, you know, keep in mind, I grew up with American beer. So right. it's just not yeah, really we need beer. To let the audience know that the dark beer is really strong. This is like 10 to 12%. Yeah. And you can get it throughout the whole year, but there is a special time of the year, which is called uh, strong beer time, if you would translate it, something like this. Okay. Okay. Wie, sagt, wie, wie sagt man auf Deutsch? Uh, Starkbierzeit. 
Stark Bier Zeit. I love it. <laughs> ich will Stark Bier Zeit. Okay, fantastic. Go ahead. It's time for the really strong beer. And this is to like 10 or 12 percent. And it's really basically dark beer. And um, they, they give it to you in special places. And there is obviously a special event. A little bit similar like the Oktoberfest, smaller, but they're even crazier because the alcohol is so strong in the beer. So people are really getting drunk there. And um, yeah, so that's the special time uh, when it comes to dark beer. <laughs> so our whole show, everyone, is just going to be about beer in Munich because, you know, now I'm jealous and now I want to come out and go into All right, so we're, I, I'm going to sort of man the chat. The, this, the way this works is we get rolling more and more people on the show. We get alumni speakers coming in. <laughs> You know, I want to welcome, of course, you know, Marco. Uh, he's joined us very early, I think, also. Um, Marco is awesome and consistent about being part of these shows and always adds good content to it. So he'll be part of the, he'll be one of the gentlemen engaging in sort of the alumni speaker part. Uh, Yoga, hopefully I'm saying your name correctly, uh, is pretty consistent about joining us, I think, from Portugal. So we, we appreciate yeah. you. And Definitely. Yeah, so uh, thank really you, thank friendly you. to crypto place. <laughs> yes, we, we love so, it. So if you if you want to to move somewhere in Europe, that that that's, that's definitely an op, uh, an option. In Portugal? Portugal. Yeah. We should do a Portugal. Sandra, we need to do a Portugal show. Actually, I, I was there a small month ago. I was in the, in the Algarve area, and you know Portugal is is great. You know it's a fantastic country. Good, uh, you know climate. People are really friendly. The food is fantastic. You have, you have good beers there, not as in Germany, but you have really good wines. So, you know, I'm, I'm all for, you know, let's create. Let's you know, whatever. actually. Yeah, go at the, at the elbow. You, 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 you faded out there for a second. Yeah, I think, I think maybe he lost his connection, but to oh, make hold, a long story. Hold, 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 hold that thought. It's just so we can, Sandra, go ahead, please. Yeah, no, so t I was going to say to make a long story short, Portugal is really great and I'm really looking forward to whenever this Corona circus, you know, is, is more or less, you know, over and we can get back to the, you know, the day's bars and maybe with some little improvements. Whenever you are here in Europe, we're going to do, and this is my vision, I, I just throw out an idea on the table, but I think it will be fantastic, Gordon. If we do the Crypto Wednesday show maybe every week or every other week from a different location, you know, we try to get the community together, we could bring her to Crypto Valley, we bring her to Florian in Munich, all different sorts of people, we get the local community involved. And this is what, what, and this is especially for the new people, this was our first goal. Remember Gordon, just three months ago, we said, why don't we pay back to the industry? You know, Why don't we get our best friends involved and share what they're excited about? And that, mm -hmm. that there's an op opportunity for everybody to network and to see where we can collaborate and, and add value or start business or you know, involve in one way or another. And what we've seen happening, and maybe I speak on, on both of us a little bit now, is that there are a lot of people from the speaker group that are you know talking to each other, they're they're sharing ideas, they're asking opinions, which is really fantastic. And that's why I was why I was business really, and friendship is forming. It's cool. Yeah, and, and that, that that's why I was really looking forward to get Florian on the on the call. Sometimes you know we have to juggle a little bit with, with the planning because not everybody is available on the same day, but today it is. So it's going to be uh, yeah, I, I think an exciting show and maybe for Florian just a just a recap. We have Florian, to, who are you? Yeah, Thunder knows That's, you. Okay, so <laughs> enough about us. Enough, enough. Uh, sorry, I just haven't seen my buddy for a long time. You know, we just, are we going to catch up on your time? Now, Florian, tell us about you. Go. Yes. Okay. Well, um, I am uh, 45 years old now and uh, born in Munich. That's what we already figured out. Yes. <laughs> and um, well, I I run a company called Midas Touch Consulting. So I'm the managing director and founder of it, and well, basically, I've been specializing, focusing on precious metals since 20 years and added the cryptocurrencies and Bitcoin seven and a half years ago. And maybe to give you a big picture about myself and how I ended up in the financial. Actually, that, that's very early. Seven and a half years ago, you started yeah, getting into Bitcoin? Yeah. yeah. Early 2013. Yeah. Fine. Well done. Yeah. Let me explain to you why and how. Um, but maybe to understand it a little better, it's important to understand and know that I'm actually coming from music. So I used to start DJing in the early 90s, mm -hmm. wow. heavily influenced by the back then so-called cosmic music from Italy, which was a special 
mix type of music in Italy. Crazy. Okay, I'm Googling that, but keep going. Okay. Cosmic very music. underground, very underground. And okay. um, so I was very passionate about music, realized then when I, I, I moved uh, into UK drum and bass, jungle and garage music that I wanted to do my own music. So I, I, I think 1994, I started producing, bought my first Atari back then. A small sampler and the last next six years you could only find me in front of those little studio gears back then mm -hmm. I studied audio engineering and went to a big major record company uh, company here in Germany to do an apprenticeship with them and when you focus so much on what you really want and put all your passion into it somehow the universe helps you and yes. op doors open and you give your best you become really good at what you're doing and so I think in 2001, I was already involved with um, the pop star casting show here in Germany and was based. Oh. Uh, we got a glitch, I think. Florian? Let's say, but oh, sorry, um, for Florian. I, I, I'm sorry for for some reason. I, I think it was your internet. I, I lost the last thirty seconds. So I oh. you you got a position with a record company. You the universe okay. helps you, and then go for sorry, yeah. The internet was not okay. Well, so I I, I I basically ended up being co-producing uh, uh, the, the the casting show in Germany called Pop Stars, and was involved in a few number one hits rather quickly. So I didn't wrote those hits, so I don't get any royalties these days, unfortunately, but at least it was a very, very good lucrative start for me being self-employed. So I, I, I founded my company, Siren Music Productions in 2000, uh, uh, mid 2000. Oh, interesting. And okay. within a year, within a year, I was involved in like, we had like five or 10 uh, number one hit recordings. And I was basically in the studio from nine in the morning until three in the night, doing nothing else than music production. And <clears throat> And um, yeah, so I made some good money to start with. I, part of it I put in the studio, and the other part I put into the bank account, obviously. And mm -hmm. then um, uh, my father died very unexpectedly, uh, uh, very quickly, and I inherited some money from that direction as well. So together, those two uh, parts of money basically was a significant amount of money so that uh, I, I had somebody in the bank basically telling me what to do. <laughs> and, and basically they took care of it. And obviously I was so busy with music and my life and, and girls and everything. So um, uh, I thought like, yeah, these guys should know what they do, right? And um, obviously they didn't. Um, uh, it, that was 2001 when the internet bubble started to burst. So that was like when big crash in the stock market. So, so I got this model in my mind of German financial planners and managers being conservative and careful is that, is that not the case here no no it's like usually your bank and the, the guys at the bank they only want to sell you products where they can make commissions right um, um obviously that's that's primarily the american way and obviously the banks in germany have done this the same for the yeah. last 20, 20 years and it got worse and worse and so they didn't have any clue i realized rather quickly that something was wrong there, but the problem was you always met with these guys and you don't understand anything what they're telling you. You mm -hmm. only realize like they don't know what they're talking about and the results are just shitty, you know? Like you have to even pay every month that they manage it for you. Mm -hmm. And the only thing you see is the portfolio is going down and down every month and they call you every month or every week. Hey, Mr. Gromes, we have something very special for you. You have no clue if it's good or bad or what it means. And um, I was in a very uncomfortable position and I realized that I needed to change that. So um, I made the decision to take this in my own hands uh, mm -hmm. and started really studying finances, financial markets, investing, trading, everything. Of course, I didn't have any clue what kind of consequences that would bring. <laughs> but um, and that's how I started out. And luckily... And sorry, uh, just, just so we have a sense of the time, that... What, what year did you take over the reins of your finances? 2001. Got it. Okay. So th th there was a period in there where you had these financial advisors, but then you said, thanks guys. 
2001. It was just it a hit a wall. experience, you know, like you pay every month and you see that the value of your money is dropped, as in the portfolio is dropping like hard during this big bear market in, in equities in the stock market. Remember the, 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 the internet bubble? Yeah. So it was a nightmare. And, and they charge you money and you work hard every week for bringing more money and they just screw it up. Yep. So um, I realized I have to, had to change something. And um, so I, I, I took this in my own hands. And um, the, the, the final point that made me doing this decision was basically when I asked him to buy some gold. And they were looking at me like, what do you want with gold? Are you nuts? Are you kidding? This doesn't mm -hmm. make any sense. And um, um, that's when I really realized like, okay, out of here as fast as possible. Right. <laughs> and so that's how I started. And, and thanks to my grandfather who, who died three months after my birth in 1975, he left me a letter with a rare American gold coin and a statement that this should be the foundation of my future wealth. I was always very open-minded towards precious metals because in 2000, all my friends, everybody around me would tell me, you need this internet stock, this is the best. Are you crazy? You don't have internet stocks. You know, all these weird dot-com names, 24 hour, whatever they were calling themselves. And they went up 10 times, 15 times on the IPO day. And then obviously they all ended up zero at some point. Well, was not all of them. Huh? Not all of them. Google, well, Amazon. Yeah. Well, <laughs> if you were lucky and put Amazon and eBay, then not. But uh, I mean, this is like really the small minority, right? And yeah. um, back then, you had no clue if it would be Amazon or eBay that will survive, really, and you had no clue at all. So, um, um, so that was basically the start. I started focusing on precious metals, thanks to my grandfather, basically. There was not a lot of research. There was not a lot of websites or anything. There was even not a lot of dealers where you could go and buy some. So mm -hmm. I started buying my first Kruger run in, in, in eBay on, on the website. I remember Kruger runs, amazing. Yeah. Yeah, and then they cost like 250 euros back then. It was a joke. And compared to today, you pay like 1,700, 1,800. So, um, and that's how I started it. And then when you start, uh, it might, once you invest in something, automatically your interest gets triggered, and suddenly you are much more focused on that. And suddenly you do the extra work and, and do much more research, looking at it, following it, uh, researching it, and all these kind of things. So that's actually what happened. And um, I quickly really became fascinated by this whole gold story because it's, a, I mean, it's 5,000 years history of mankind. Uh, lots of events in history, in our recent history, in the last one, 200 years are basically connected and related to gold. And then, of course, if you come from a gold buck perspective, so to speak, you realize that our money system somehow is kind of, something is wrong. Um, and the more you dig, the more you figure out there is something really big time wrong. And that's how it all happened. And then I started writing down my research. I went to lots of seminars. I went into mm. technical analysis, wrote my ideas down about the gold market, about the price projections. I showed this to my bullion dealer in Munich, I think in 2003 or four, and he liked it a lot. And then a year later or something, he came to me mm. asking me if I would like to write this for his company. And that company became the, one of the largest bullion dealer, not only in Germany, but in Europe over the last 15 years. And I started writing, job. Uh, not because of me, but I, I, I basically w was publishing for them. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, yeah, I became a gold, well-known gold expert in Germany over the years. And basically that was the reason why I started my, my company called Midas Touch Consulting, because I realized Music is kind of like, had become really challenging at the same time, you know, downloads, internet, Napster. I've heard, I've heard that from several people who were involved in the industry. Yeah, it's been a nightmare for many years. Now it starts to look a little bit better, but mm -hmm. between, between 2001 and 2010 or 15, the industry only knew one way and that was down. Less yeah. royalties, less money, less income, everything, and like big time less. And so uh, it was a good decision looking back. Um, and... Yeah, so that's how I started Midas Touch Consulting. When you study uh, gold, you study financial markets, you study history, and then with the time you come, become much more aware of things. And in 2013, I realized that people in Cyprus used Bitcoin to move their money out of the island. Right. That was before the, the island went bankrupt and insolvent and the haircuts that people got in their bank account. Huh? I'm not sure if you know. Oh, I, I, my, 
Let me put this way, what my, what my, okay, my cat wants to join the show and is not being very clear about this. Um, yeah, my, my wife's Russian. I'm very involved with the Russian community and a lot of them had accounts in Cyprus and got haircuts exactly. while so that was going on. And the strange thing is Cyprus has kind of bounced back a little bit as a place to get golden visas and have bank accounts, which I would have thought, given the level of trust breaking that they engaged in, I, I would have never thought would happen. But they seem to have done a decent job coming back. But I, I think for the people who were involved with that at the time, it was a very rough experience. It was a very rough experience. And don't forget, I mean, a tax haven is certainly tempting always. <laughs> so, yeah. I mean, it, it, you pay less taxes in Cyprus. So that's why many millionaires in the Euros don't like to move there. Um, it's very simple. So, yep. um, and it's beautiful. I mean, you have a great climate. Um, it's a very nice island. I've been there too. I liked it a lot. So um, nothing wrong about this, but you're right. It, it bounced. I believe, uh, don't get me wrong. I'm not anti cyprus It's just, you know, that's such a, to, to nationalize bank accounts is such a aggressive act. You right. think it's, you think there'd be, forget the country. You think there'd be a consequence for a while, but the fact. I think it did, but it's already seven and a half years ago, no? And, uh, oh, just seven and a half years, you know? So. <laughs> uh, quite some time already. Look, I mean, back then, Bitcoin was trading below 100 bucks, you know, so, um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, okay, so go, go ahead. So you, so for my I there. became really aware of Bitcoin. I had a few other guys, because precious metals, gold bucks, they are also always rather libertarians and free spirits, and they are basically for free markets because mm -hmm. of the lessons from history. And um, um, so, it was not that in the typical gold bug scene, Bitcoin was popular, but there were a few individuals that were very open-minded and had already figured out a little bit more about Bitcoin. There was already one guy, uh, a friend of mine who, who had started mining. And he, actually that's like the, the, the people around the, the Genesis mining guys, basically then uh, who became one of the largest mm -hmm. Bitcoin miner in the world. Um, so that's the background of how I came into Bitcoin. And obviously back then I was just like, okay, let's try this. I took 50 bucks and, and bought half a Bitcoin or a little bit more and, and it worked. Uh, go with, yeah. <laughs> and then I sent it from one wallet to another and it worked. Okay, let's send it. Wow, this works. Let's buy another Bitcoin for 50 bucks or whatever. I think. And yeah, and then within 12 months, this thing was skyrocketed to 1300. I mean, it was amazing, it was unbelievable. And um, it was really still early days and I didn't took it so serious or, I mean, it was very interesting, but not like, mm. I mean, of course, looking back, yeah, I should have put all my money into it, but that's like the typical thing that everybody would say. I mean, so, how, how, how do you know that? Right, I know. Exactly. You don't know it, right? So I, that's it, what it, I want It's to all shot in a Florida. It's not shot in a Florida, this one where, you know, it's all FOMO, so. Right. So I, I, I didn't have a clue that this would go to 20K and would maybe become such a big thing at some point in the future. But it was very interesting. And that's how I got into Bitcoin. And then, yeah, over the years, I started to add Bitcoin um, and then later Ethereum to our research and Midas Touch. And I recommended it officially uh, first time, I think, in 2015 at $300. So when it spiked to 1300 we had this big correction from like 1200, 1300, it went all the way back to $150. You know? And that was due to the Mount Gox crash mm -hmm. and all these weird things. And then basically a year silence, not too much happened uh, on the forefront, but obviously in the backyard, people were developing, things happened a lot. And um, yeah, and then when finally there was this double bottom around $150 and you could see, okay, it looks like a trend change. At $300, I recommended it to buy in, in late 2015. I think. And then in two, three months later, I came across Ethereum. It mm -hmm. was trading at, at around four or five dollars. I also recommended it then after some research. And back then it was like smart contracts, decentralized. Wow, that's kind of interesting. But it was still like uh, kind of like a very abstract concept, you know. And but still I liked it. I believed in the sector. I I mean, if you believe in, in free markets and competition, you like these kind of things, you believe that there will somehow come something good out of it. And yeah, and so fast forward to today, uh, we have a weekly crypto chart book where my partner Corbinian, who's also based in Los Angeles, is basically sharing his trading. That's the one who didn't want to wake up at 5.30 in the morning? Aw. No, no, he has family and things to do until I think eight or nine. 
So um, I, I'm, I'm kidding. I, I, because my family's in uh, Europe right now, I, I've moved myself to European time. Ooh. So I'm, I'm, I'm in the process. I'm waking up at 3:30 a.m. LA, and I'm going to. I'm trying to go to bed at 6:30, 7:30 p.m. But this is this is just because I have no social life whatsoever in America. <laughs> so, no. Good, yeah. good. So, so, so he, we have basically a weekly um, chart book on, on Bitcoin. We also do this for silver and gold. I publish every two weeks a very uh, in-depth, comprehensive study on either Bitcoin or gold. I have basically non-stop publishing stuff. We have a paid subscription newsletter for precious metals here in German. And I am getting featured on many shows, presentations, um, especially in the precious metals sector but also in the cryptocurrency sector. And because, yeah, I mean, now I have 20 years of experience and, and I mean, I started buying my first stock 25 years ago, but like really taking this seriously in my own hands is like 20 years. And obviously I made a lot of mistakes and painful learning lessons, but I never gave up. I always uh, believed in myself and in, in, in being able to uh, achieve it and make it. And I did. And um, obviously, Bitcoin uh, was a part of it, an important part of it. It always treated me well, um, I have to really say. The painful, more painful lessons I learned with, with gold. Um, and probably when I, when I got in touch with Bitcoin, I had already enough experience to avoid worst case <laughs> situations. <laughs> Interesting. Well, so l l let, me, <clears throat> let me kind of dive into your philosophy a little bit. Though. I understand the libertarian free market assignment of meaning to gold, if you like, or I think I do. But the issue I have with holding just gold or gold, gold straight gold, not, not just gold, because that implies 100% holding. You know, the problem I have with gold gold and making that a majority component of the account is it's not a return producing asset. It's not producing dividends not producing earnings. It's pure supply and demand, like I think most commodities. And I don't think it's kept up with inflation over the past 25 years. I, 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 my dad was into it way back when, you know, he passed away a long time ago, but, and I remember in the seventies, which I think, you're, I think everyone here is too young to remember, but I remember the, you know, that we were going into inflation Precious, precious metals, crude grounds were all trendy. And if you had stayed with just precious metals from then to now, you would have missed out on a lot, like a lot. So even if the systems are gonna ultimately fail, even if there's something to that, I mean, how do you justify holding pure gold in a, any kind of significant amount? All right. Well, I, I haven't said uh, so far here today, and I never said it in the past that you should put 100% or 50% of your net worth. No, you, you certainly did, and I wasn't implying that, but how, how do you... I'm just saying... So what's that's, your general that's, positioning, I guess? But, but I, I, I need to, like, uh, uh, I mean, this is a misperception, all right? In the end of the day, it's portfolio allocation or asset allocation, right? And I think we agree also... It, it's probably not a good idea if you put 100% of your money or your net worth into Bitcoin. I'm not sure it's not a good idea. I but, think but, 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 I, but I understand what you're saying. I, I would say, and that's usually what I experienced. If you mm -hmm. talk to this Bitcoin maximalists, which certainly have a few very important and, and, and points and rightfully so, but um, nobody knows the future. Everything can happen. And um, the more money you have, the more you need to have diversification, right? If you have yes. $1,000, yes, okay, you put it all in Bitcoin. Okay, I agree. You can always make a thousand bucks. 5,000, 10,000, I would still agree you could do it. Huh? But once you have a million, it's totally absurd to put everything on one horse, right? I agree. So, and that's the same thing with gold, obviously. So my saying has been over the last 10, 15 years, always 10 to 25% of your net worth you put it in physical gold and silver, you put it away, uh, not an ETF, not in the banking system. It has to be a vault outside the banking system. And that's your worst case insurance. And that has worked for the last 5,000 years. You're, you're saying, what, what was that percentage? 10 to 25%. In physical gold or physical gold and silver. Right. 
outside the banking system. So you don't get your vote with Bank America or, or HSBC or Deutsche Bank, right? Has to, there is lots of storing facilities, uh, trustworthy ones, but not the banking system. Because on a, on a, on a, on a, on a bank jubilee or on a, on a bank holiday, everything will be closed. And the day you will need your gold, you cannot access it. So um, that's why you want to store it outside the banking system. And you need to understand that gold can, can I push on that a little bit? Yeah. So suppose I just took the middle road there and took 15% of my wealth and stored it in these assets. That, that's 15% of my wealth that's not producing earnings, not producing dividends, not active, just subject to regular commodity type supply and demand price fluctuations year after year after year. So I, I'm missing all the earnings that those resources could generate, all the dividends. And I mean earnings in the enterprise sense. And I'm missing them compounding over the years. And that seems like a lot. And, I, I'm, and I, I, I'm not sure you're better off 10, 20 years later, assuming the system doesn't crash and it doesn't seem to have crashed yet. And I understand it might. Okay. But well, that's I mean, a lot. So, so if, if we go in this kind of direction, it, it, the topic gets obviously bigger and, and the question actually is much larger. Than you that's what you're, you're a deep thinker. Point. That's why we have you on the show. We, we don't play around here. This is, right. this is not the fluff no, show. No, this is I mean, like, let, let's go at it show. <laughs> so I, and I, I, I know I, you can handle it. So all yours. I have, I have no problems with stocks, first of all. Okay. I love the stock market too, but I believe in cycles. So there is a winter, there is a summer, there is a time to seed, there and so on and so on. You know what yes. I'm talking about. So I don't think we are in a time where you will want to be super aggressive with stocks in general. If you pick Tesla and Amazon, I congratulate you. And if you hold it for the last five years, perfect. It was a great investment, no doubt about it. Okay. Um, but usually people trying to play the stock market with lots of either different stocks or they go with ETFs and then you have like the MSCI World Index ETF and suddenly you have 5,000 stocks and they all go up between, in, on average, between five and 10% over the years. If you look at the same uh, with gold, gold has similar returns over the last 50 years, okay? So you mentioned the early 70s, back then you could buy one ounce of gold for $35. $35. Today you pay nearly $1,900. So the average return of a physical ounce of gold, which basically doesn't pay any dividends, the contrary, if you store it in a safe vault, like I just told you, you even have to pay every year a little bit of money just to have the, the vault for you. Um, it does, sorry, let, let me pause you for a second. So it, it's true that back when we had it in a forced exchange rate, it was $35. But I, I personally remember during the 70s when the crew grounds were hot and all this, you know, when Carter was president and all this jazz. And now the gold, I think somewhere in there got up to 800. Right. Okay. But so the, from the 70s to now, from 800 to 900, it's nice, but it's not the problem that, is, that nice. The problem with these kind of comparisons is always the starting point. Where do you pick the starting point of your comparison? Right? Yes. So if you pick it at 2000, the time frame that we talked initially, where I basically made this decision about taking finances in my own hands, gold has been outperforming everything else since 2000. Only if you bought Apple stock, um, you would have done better. But if you bought a general basket of stocks in the American stock market or a European stock market, gold would have outperformed everything because in 2000, mm -hmm. one ounce of gold cost uh, $250. Today it's nineteen hundred dollars, so it's up seven times. Okay, interesting point. So if I look at the DAX, who was trading back then, when I basically made this money with music and then brought it to the bank and they screwed it up, the DAX was trading at eight thousand points. Today it's trading at less than thirteen thousand, twelve thousand eight hundred. So it's not even doubled since then. If I would have in the, invested in the index only, okay. Usually the index changes over the years. So the Dow Jones is not the same Dow Jones like 20 years ago. Most mm -hmm. of the stocks has been, if you compare it to hundred years ago, the Dow Jones, I think General Electric's until recently was the only stock that was still in the Dow Jones. Everything else had left because it went bankrupt. It took, had been taken over or was so small that they threw it out. 
Mm. And um, these are things are fluctuating. So again, it's very difficult to compare it. And um, assuming that we would all be great stock pickers and picking Amazon in the late 90s or Tesla uh, 10 years ago, uh, this is like rather rarely the case, you know? So you have to be very uh, careful with how you compare things. And uh, I can tell you that gold is a safe haven. It's a worst case insurance. And it always keeps your purchasing power over the long haul. So um, that's actually quite, quite a good thing. And there's other, it doesn't pay dividends, but gold is something you don't have to worry about. You don't have to read balance sheets or the latest news or anything. You just can leave it in the corner or in your vault for the next 30 years. And you can give it to your children. You, let, you don't even have to look one time at the price because it's such a, uh, it, it has no counterparty risk. It has just always been money for the last 5,000 years and it will remain so. And I, I, I would say for the foreseeable next 20 to 50 years, at least, it's very unlikely that we're going to meet an asteroid full of gold and then the price will drop. This is like, it, it's ridiculous, that kind of argument. So, so um, does your point of view extend to other precious metals, silver, platinum, they are different a little bit. Silver has actually, it's, silver is actually a very interesting investment case at the moment because it's been lagging gold. Gold has a very nice bull run over the last two years. So it's up 100% since August 2018. Um, um, it, silver is still lagging a little bit. That's typical behavior. You always see silver lagging in the beginning of a bull market in precious metals. And then towards the end of the bull market, suddenly silver shows up and runs much faster and much further than any of the other metals. So, um, um, I, and silver is cheap, so recycling doesn't make sense. It, most of the silver that has ever been mined is basically used and doesn't exist anymore. Uh, silver is a very, has a very strong case for battery metals, green metals. Uh, on uh, the, uh, I'm sorry, back up, back up for a second. Is it, did I hear correctly? They said that most of the silver that exists has already been mined? Did I hear that? It's been all, no, I, yes. All the silver that has been mined is basically, basically used. It doesn't exist. It's not available anymore. I see. It's not like gold that has been hoarded somewhere in the boat in Switzerland and it's coming to the market once the price is much higher. Um, silver, it's, it's just gone because it's in, in your cell phone, in your, in, in your car, in I your solar cells, it's everywhere. And the price has been so cheap that nobody was interested in recycling it. So this, this is gone. You will have to. Uh, so for new silver, you need to mine it. You can't go buy it really from in, in, right. the, in, in the usual sense. If investment demand kicks in, um, there is not enough silver around. And, this, and, and I mean, that's maybe something where we come later to, but this whole process of mining, I mean, that's what Satoshi obviously copied and, and, and improved and brought it to a next level, right? Because this whole mining process comes from precious metals. So. Um, uh, you cannot basically uh, su increase the supply of gold overnight. It's impossible. It takes mm -hmm. 10 years to build a new mine. Initially, there's a prospector on, on, on green fields and checking the earth and get, take some, some samples and, and some stone samples. And then maybe they drill a little bit, but then they have to collect big time money to get professional drill equipment until they figure out, is there really something in the ground? How do we construct the mine? Then it takes ages to get the permits and bring the mine in. It takes 10 years from the point that somebody thinks like, ah, maybe that's a good area to mine gold and silver. Mm. It looks like we have some anomalies. Uh, they can do this with 3D models these days, but still it takes 10 years to build the mine. And most of those exploration areas and projects actually never end up being a mine because often they don't get the finances, they don't get the permits or the, the grades are not good enough. So it's a long, long process. And, and it's, it's similar like with Bitcoin mining. You cannot simply create gold and silver overnight. It's a very lengthy process. And you have to actually invest a lot of money to get it out of the ground. So um, silver has a strong investment case down the road over the next five to 30 years because it is needed for solar uh, energy, solar cells massively. It is needed for electric cars. It is needed in smartphones. It is needed now, especially with the Corona crisis also for for pharmaceutical products. Mm -hmm. And um, most of the silver has been used. 
And um, it's very cheap still. So I think it's a very interesting investment. And I personally overweight uh, currently silver to gold. So I'm buying, if I, if on those dips and pullbacks, I buy silver and not gold at the moment. It sounds like the argument for silver is fundamentally different from gold. I mean, gold seems like a store value. It has a lot of meaning load associated to it, which can be with libertarianism and historical usage and hard money and all this other stuff. Silver seems like you're making more of a utilitarian type argument, or more of a market consumption type argument. Like it, it really is being used for stuff and there's a limited amount. Silver has uh, industrial demand, strong de industrial demand. It is needed in lots of things. And um, um, it, that's not the case for gold. There are also industrial use cases, but not as many as for silver. Um, so, uh, and, and then if we talk about platinum and palladium, those two are definitely mainly uh, driven by industrial demand. They are even rarer than, than, than gold and silver in the earth, but uh, and therefore much harder to get. Most of the supply for platinum and palladium comes from Russia and South Africa. There are a few mines in, in North America and Canada uh, as well, but um, those two countries have a huge in, uh, influence on the pricing. And, it's, uh, and you need this also for the, the, the car industry. It needs a lot of palladium over the last uh, years. And you could see that palladium prices have been skyrocketing. Uh, it's it, actually an ounce of palladium currently is more expensive than an ounce of gold. Um, and it didn't used to be that. So um, the most undervalued probably right now is pal uh, platinum because palladium took over. It, it, it used to be cheaper and it had been replaced in the car industry. Um, and, 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 and platinum actually is the rarest of the four metals, but mm -hmm. um, it used to be more expensive than gold. Now it's actually nearly half the price of gold. Really? So, uh, Platinum is cheaper than gold? Yeah, yeah. It's unbelievable. Uh, I, I'm out of touch. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so platinum is certainly very interesting and, and, and silver as well. So for, there is a, uh, there's a nice ratio that I like to follow. It's called the gold-silver ratio. You basically take the price for one ounce of gold and divide it by the price of one ounce for silver. Okay. And, and you can like... Uh, dig in the nature. If you go outside and dig uh, uh, in the nature, you will find usually for every one ounce of gold, you will find nine ounces of silver. That's more or less the ratio given by nature. Let's say make it easy one to 10. Okay. That's more or less the ratio. Okay. The market currently is trading at one to 80. So completely out of sync with nature. Silver is extremely undervalued. Silver is a byproduct of copper production um, zinc and lead production. And there was no investment demand in silver over the last few years. So well, it, it, it's undervalued, assuming if they were the same or had the exact same characteristics, it would be undervalued. And you can yeah, say, I mean, you, yeah, there's always obviously different perceptions, why and, and how, of course. But, right. but if, you, if you would say that generally, maybe it's a little bit easier to get silver out of the ground because it's a byproduct of copper, mm -hmm. but then again, Generally, mining is difficult and it takes a lot of money, so it's not a huge difference. And in the, in the earth, you will find 10 ounces of silver for, for one ounce of gold. But currently, the market is treating it as it would be 80 ounces of silver in the ground for one ounce of gold. You can make the case that gold is overvalued and silver is undervalued, um, something like this. You know, that's the, the thought process. And you put in these ratios, and that's actually also an important point that I wanted to mention before when we started to talk about all this. There's another ratio that I recommend everybody to look at. It's called the Dow Jones gold ratio. Hmm. So you okay. divide the price for the Dow Jones by the price for one ounce of gold. And the beauty of that calculation is that the dollar gets out of the, the equation, right? Because they print a lot of dollars every day. Mm -hmm. the balance sheets all the time. How can you measure something if it's getting more and more and more? It's totally relative. What does it mean that the Dow Jones is at X price today and at that price 10 years ago, if in the meantime, they printed so much money, it had to go up. Right? I, I, get it. I, I, I like the philosophy behind this ratio. Right. So yeah. you take the price of Dow Jones, which is in dollar, divided through the price of one ounce of gold in dollars. And what you get is a number. And at the top, 
of the stock market bubble, the internet bubble in, in 2000, you had to pay 45 ounces of gold for one time the Dow Jones, okay? Nowadays, uh, I need to tell you, I need to look it up, but um, it should be around 15, I think, at the moment. It, in the 1980, you mentioned the, the high in gold in the late 70s, early 80s. That was when gold was completely overvalued and the stock market was undervalued. You had to pay one ounce of gold for the whole basket of the Dow Jones. So it's like a pendulum. It goes from one extreme to the other one, right? It's not, not a completely nin linear thing. It's obviously back up and down and it's kind of weird and chaotic moves. Mm -hmm. But in the end of the day, it goes from one extreme to the other extreme. So in 1980, you had to pay one ounce of gold for one time the whole basket of Dow Jones stocks. In 2000, 20 years later, you had to pay 45 ounces of gold for one time the Dow Jones. Nowadays, you have to pay, I think, 15. I look it up. Um, uh, and I assume it will go all the way down to the last extreme at one. That's basically the overall, the big picture trend since 2000. It hasn't changed. Even though we had a bull markets in between and bear markets and stocks mm -hmm. and, also and precious metals, the overall, the big picture trend, in my opinion, is pro gold and against the stock market. And it is because the internet uh, bubble in 2000 basically was a peak in, in, in society, in many things. I remember just from a musician perspective, the music was much more happy in the late 90s, early 2000s than today. It was a completely different vibe in the clubs. It was all disco influenced, happy. <laughs> that's, an awesome, that's an awesome observation. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I, I've never heard anyone correlate the internet era with sort of the, the maximum state of society and happy music. And, but, and you know what, you, you may actually be right. That, that, Look, that's the funniest I've thing I've ever, that's the cleverest funny thing I've ever heard. So go, go ahead. <laughs> that's Look, awesome. I, I, I'm a child of house music in the, in the 90s. Me, me I too. love the disco, yeah. houseful, soulful house music. And when we were in the club, it was really good vibes. If I go there today, it's all minimalistic, deep, the, the more hey, hey, I, I like that stuff. I, I work to that stuff, so be nice. I, but I, I, I know what you mean. I, I got it. I got it. Min Different minimal vibe. isn't exactly happy music. <laughs> and, and I think this is all correlated to each other, and it is mm -hmm. a reflection of the mood in society. And honestly, all these problems, all the stress, everything you initially said in the beginning today, what you witnessed yesterday in the debates, 20 years ago, this was a different world. I mean, internet was just starting. Everybody looked forward, like how great the future will be. Nowadays, everybody's looking forward how, how painful and terrible the future will be. Personally, you can do a different approach, but like from a society perspective, yes. right? Uh, everybody is like painting it black, right? Like uh, the worst case is like the, the, the case that will happen. And, and, and <clears throat> I think, and in, in I remember the, 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 the type of music in, in, in 2000 at the peak, it was really, really, really party and good vibes, like positive. And not like what you see today, all this fake show of, and et cetera, et cetera. And, and it was still an analog time. Now we are completely digitized. It's social media everywhere. Life changed dramatically. Um, but the markets never really recovered. If you look at the real, in real terms, and that's when you have to look at, at the Dow Jones, not in, in dollars, because mm -hmm. they created so much more dollars, it's relative. You have to look at the Dow Jones in gold ounces. And that gives you a completely different picture, completely different picture. And this is actually true for also the most of the European uh, stock indices. So the, the German DAX doesn't look as good at all if you if you calculate it in, in, in gold ounces. And especially also it doesn't look good if you if you if you withdraw the dividends that are basically calculated into the index in, in, in contrast to the Dow Jones. So I believe that um, because I mean, look, if you go much further back 50 years ago, it was easy for, for a family that one of the two parents went to work and the money was enough easily, no problem. Because the money was worth much more in terms of purchasing power. And all that happened since, and that is the reason for the, the crash, the internet crash in, in 2000. That's when the Fed, the Federal Reserve Bank in America really started to expand the balance sheets. They lowered interest rates basically started the next bubble. Back then it was the real estate bubble and it started in 2003, four, and then bursted in 2007 and eight. 
And then we, and since then, since the financial crisis in 10, uh, 12 years ago, we never re really recovered at all anyway. I mean, it's only crisis management since then. More QE, more balance sheet expansions, more uh, debts. And that's the ongoing story. And it's not only in America, it's even worse here in the Eurozone, where they basically, this whole zone is bankrupt. Spain is bankrupt, Portugal is bankrupt, Italy is bankrupt. They all are bankrupt. Greece is bankrupt. The only thing they're doing is print much more money, expanding. How, how is this even possible? I, I got to ask, like, how, how is Europe bankrupt? It's the weirdest thing. <laughs> it's because they don't let the free market do its job. The free market would have punished all the banks, they would have gone bankrupt, the countries would have gone bankrupt, but that would have been a scary end, but it would have also been the chance for a new start. Instead, we're just continuing, trying to figure out, lingering through this whole scenario, but it's not getting better. You don't solve anything with expanding the balance sheets, creating currency out of thin air. You don't solve any problem. Instead, what is now happening, we have in, in Europe, in Germany, we have negative real interest rates. So the money that you put in the bank is basically nothing worth anymore. No, you have to pay on top that the bank, bank takes the money from you. I mean, you have to think about this, what this really means. It's like you go to a restaurant and the owner of the restaurant has to pay you that you even go to him and eat his food. That's what it is. And you, yeah, but it, this is the truth and look, how many people out there have a hard time bringing home enough money every month? It's tough. It's really tough. You, you, your salaries usually don't keep up with the, with the loss of purchasing power. Uh, everything is getting more expensive. Um, people don't necessarily make more money. Instead, uh, now two parents have to work to, to feed the family. Um, um, it's really challenging. It's really challenging. And this is all connected. And this has all to do with the wrong money system. Um, so uh, this is really a um, very complex picture, I understand, but we've been always coming back to the 70s when the gold bull market started in, in the early two, uh, 70s, when gold cost one ounce, uh, $35. In 1971, Richard Nixon closed the gold window. I should say, let me interrupt, you know, you've, you've made a couple of good ratios. Do you have a gold, silver, or Bitcoin ratio? Do you have a Dow Jones gold, Bitcoin ratio? <laughs> Yeah, I have, a, I have a Bitcoin gold ratio, which I love because it tells you which of the two sound money uh, is doing better at the moment and which one uh, will outperform the other one. And it looks like Bitcoin is on the way to start outperforming gold again. So um, I, I always have this. Okay, yeah, the next question is why? Why it's outperforming gold? Why, you said it looks like it's going to start outperforming gold again. Why? Right. Well, look. Let's uh, let me share. Can I sc share my screen here? Okay. Uh, I think I'll let you. Hold on. Let me try. Yeah, yeah I should. I have one. Job. Yeah, I, I think you can, uh, Florian. You're, you're co-hosting, so you can share. Yeah. Um, let me see. Um, if, you, if you hit an issue, let me know. Um, where can I go? Uh, I I'm going to do all participants because I. I'm okay with people who are on this chat. I, this would be dangerous otherwise, I think. <laughs> well, I just need to figure it out how to do it. I never did it in, in, in Zoom. However, um, um, yes, the, if you divide the price for one Bitcoin by the price for one ounce of gold, again, both of them are nominated or denominated in US dollars. So mm -hmm. you get rid of the dollar and you get a real picture of what is Bitcoin doing against gold. That's the beauty of this, because the US dollar is distorting everything. If you expand the supply of dollars constantly, how can you measure it? it mm. It's like, it doesn't say anything. So I like to look at these ratios because they give you a more honest view of what's really going on. And I've been doing this, I honestly don't know of anybody else who, who's doing this so far, but um, let's see, can you see this? Yes. Yeah, so this is the, the ratio gold, uh, Bitcoin against gold. And this is like for the last four years. And you can see um, the, 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 the bubble that started in 2017 for Bitcoin. Uh, this ratio went up to 15 ounces of gold that you have to pay for one uh, Bitcoin. And obviously, if we go all the way back to 2013, for example, uh, the, the ratio was a totally different number. 
gold was much more expensive than Bitcoin. Um, but like, right, simply from a technical analysis perspective, this is a huge triangle that has been in the making for the last two, two and a half years. And uh, you can see that gold, uh, that Bitcoin is breaking out against gold here in the right, the right side of the chart. You can see I, I marked it with a green circle. Mm -hmm. basically. That's where this ratio is basically breaking out above this downtrend that has been in place for the last uh, few years, two and a half years. So the likelihood that Bitcoin will at some point over the next few months and years really start outperforming gold again is rather high. This chart doesn't tell me that uh, gold will outperform Bitcoin. Okay, this would only happen if it breaks the lower green trend line. Then I would say, okay, looks like gold is, uh, is, is getting stronger than Bitcoin for the, for the next few years. But that's actually a pretty positive outlook for, for Bitcoin just from that perspective. Okay? And it's, make, it's logical because um, it's a much smaller market. Uh, supply is even tighter than gold now, thanks to the halving. And uh, it has this technology uh, uh, part of it as well, um, which gold obviously doesn't have. It's the same old metal since 5,000 years. Um, and there is a lot of gold sitting in the vaults that could come to the market at higher pl uh, prices. Um, so I believe- Well, sorry, like let, let, let me jump in because that's what I like to do. The, the static nature of gold, I, th I think works in its favor sometimes. And I, I've gotten into arguments with people or heated discussions with people about the, the inability to upgrade Bitcoin because of the way that the community works and how hard it is to fork and keep the original community in a way adds value to it because it, it's much harder to 51% attack it, for example, from a, like the, the fact that Bitcoin has sort of stalled out in terms of its development may help it because some of that development may deprive it of value or gives inordinate control to some group. So maybe if the non-technological nature of gold helps it in some ways. Yeah, if it remains uh, as stable as it did over the last 10 years, it, it could be a, a, a positive great factor for Bitcoin, I agree. I mean, this whole concept of digital scarcity is still very difficult for many people to grasp. Um, my point always has been, and I, I really need to mention this here again, I always thought, and I think if you listen to me, it's clear, I always said, and I still think you want to have both. This whole argument and all uh, this, this, this crazy fight, it, should it be gold or Bitcoin, is totally useless. It doesn't make sense. Because we are living in a time where they constantly uh, devalue your currency. Okay, the US dollar, the euro, the Australian dollar, the British pound, the Brazilian real, you name it, I will tell you they devaluating it because they're expanding the balance sheet. They do the same in China, even more than in many other countries. Right. And um, that's, so you need to have something that is out of the system. You need to have something that gives you a safe haven kind of uh, thing. And as long as this is in place, and that's what we're coming back to why, why I said in 2000, basically society moved pre peaked because since then they are doing this devaluation since then they are really doing it massively and on an exponential level, looking back today from what they did in 2000, it looks small, but back then it was a big step. And actually this, all this internet bubble in 99 and 2000 was also actually, um, basically they put fire into this whole, bubble that was developing because they, they, they saved the, the LTCM hedge fund in 1998. And that was basically the first time that they really violated their own rules and did something that, hey, that they had never done before. And that's basically put them on a path where we are today. They cannot stop it anymore. They will do it more and more and more on an exponential basis. And you can see now we're talking billions, trillions. I mean, we, Sander, here in the Eurozone, I'm not sure if you're aware, but Madame Lagarde, the French ECB president, never mm -hmm. elected, by the way, democratically, never elected democratically. She's expanding the European, the balance sheet of the European Central Bank every week by 10 to 30 billion euros, every week. M million or billion? Huh? Billion, billion. Billion with B, Jesus, okay. Every week. And you can see these statics, um, uh, 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 because uh, thankfully they still have to publish 
these uh, numbers. So um, let's, uh, let's share this again. I have another chart here for you. Can you see this? Yes. And, and, and by the way, your, 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 your point is well taken. You're, I, I understand you're not suggesting, like, even people associated with you with gold, you're not suggesting just gold, you're suggesting a, a blend or portfolio, a sort of stand apart assets. So you're right. not caught up in this craziness. You need to have something that protects you against this. And you can see this is the balance sheet of the European Central Bank. And this is since uh, 2008 when the financial price crisis really started to, to, to go up. And um, since then, the, 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 the balance sheet, back then I think it was less than a, 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 a thousand uh, a billion. Now it's at 6,500. So it's up more than six times. Sander, if you would be employed with the company, are you getting six times the salary uh, of 12 years ago? No, a little bit less, uh, Florian. Exactly. That's slightly less, less. <laughs> only slightly less, because Sander's great. Right, right. So that's the reality. If people cannot describe it, they don't understand it, they don't get the points together, but they go to the street and, and are angry because something is wrong here. And they cannot really word it, they don't really see, cannot connect the dots because it's super complicated. And you do need to do a lot of homework, but that's the reality. The, 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 the value of money is, is, is diminishing by the day. And I have to say, it's not money, it's currencies, you know? The euro, the dollar is just currency. They can create as much as they want with a mouse click. It's not like in the 1920s, when between 1920 and 1923 in Germany, we had the hyperinflation. And in books from that time, you can read how they describe, they heard the printing presses running wilds the whole night. They didn't stop 25 hours, nonstop, they were printing the money. Today, we still use that phrase but the reality is it's just a mouse click and boom, there is another miraculously created uh, few billions out of nothing with a mouse click. Wow. So um, that's how it is today. And then they shift it and put it in that balance sheet or they give it to that company. And somehow it sums up this money is all in the system. And um, it, it will not go away, but it is devaluating the currency. We all need currency because if we want to do business with each other, we need to have a form of uh, paying each other because if you work for me, you give your time, your energy, you give your brain, everything. So I need to give you something back, obviously. I cannot pay you in pigs or apples or whatever, or old books. You want to have something that other people will accept as well. That's how money was basically created uh, for mankind step by step in a try and error process over the last few thousand years. And right now they're destroying it. And that's one of the reasons because society is getting so distorted, our transactions in between us, because the money is not worth anything anymore. Um, so that's the big problem. And um, I believe Bitcoin, gold, silver are probably the best tools for you to protect yourself against that. And you could see it. I mean, Bitcoin has been the best investment for the last 10 years. It has outperformed gold and silver. It had out, has outperformed the stock market. It has basically outperformed everything. And uh, if, you, if you forget about Bitcoin, because it's still rather a new asset class, if you look over the last 50 years or 100 years, you can say and see, and I can show you the evidence, gold has outperformed everything else as well. Because your, the stocks that your grandfather hold uh, 50 years ago, you don't have them anymore. They are long gone. Either the, the company went bankrupt or the banker told you to sell it or you sold it or whatever it happened. So this idea that you collect over 50 years beautiful dividends from a company is rather <laughs> not real, you know? Um, it maybe is the case for 10 years, 20 years, but you can see nowadays, uh, for example, until recently, big oil and gas companies like Royal Dutch Shell paid five to eight to 10% dividend. Great so-called dividend aristocrats. So they, mm -hmm. Basically, always increase the dividends. If you look at the stock price now and at the dividends, it's all going south. So you might be, have been good off over the last 20 years holding that stock uh, and collecting the dividends. But nowadays, if you look at that stock, it's probably time to make a decision if that trend really is still in your favor or now working against you because the whole world, for some reason, thinks that you want to move away from oil and gas. So. Uh, and then you look at pharma who used to pay big dividends, but again, very questionable companies. Um, so I'm just telling you things are changing all the time and cycles are changing. And for me, 
my big picture analysis is we're still in the same cycle that started in 2000. We need to have assets that are outside the normal uh, banking and money system because they devaluating all the time. Let, let, let me ask a question. What, what, what is the Midas Touch model? Uh, you mean from what we're doing as a company? I, I, th I think you published something. I feel like it's related. So it's on your website or? Yes. So look, my the background, because what I told you or explained to you, it was very painful in the early 2000s. So I decided I also want to help people. And I'm not here just to make the quick buck and, and just rip people off. So I keep as good as I can our research for free and, and use a sponsoring model so that I get paid for our work, obviously. We cannot always give in everything free away, right? But we use sponsorships. So usually our research is sponsored and people can read it, get it for free. And, um, and that's the way we, we make money, but we also have uh, uh, consulting offers. So I, I, I consult with private individuals. I get booked for, for speaking and presentations. And anyway, I'm a trader and, a, and, a, and an investor myself. So I, I trade my own money. And um, um, I also have a paid subscription newsletter here in, in Germany, for in German for uh, precious metals related investments. So we also do mining stocks, silver, and, and so on and so on. We help people what to buy physically because there's also a lot of different things you could do. And um, so this is some of the, and we are consultants. I mean, I, I, I'm consulting actually quite a lot. Because I, I looked through your website and I saw some of your other videos and they're, they're good, they're interesting. Um, you, you made the point, it's interesting you mentioned Germany in the 20s and 30s, you, you, know, you made the point on a recent show about sort of the, the Weimar Republic-like aspect of, yeah. of present monetary policy. And you know, right. obviously that didn't play out too nicely politically. <laughs> and yet we have that happening on a global level right now. We have it happening in the U.S. big time with this printing, quantitative easing, and we have it, have it you know, according, according to the screen you're sharing, maybe to a lesser degree, but still real happening in the Eurozone. And I'm personally not in a position to move to Japan or China or somewhere else. So, you know, Just to it's share kind of freaky. Like, how, how, how do you get out of this system with your body? <laughs> right. That's the big question. And I think even if you don't uh, study it uh, as much and even if you don't want to spend so much time with it, because I understand that for most people it's just headache and it just feels so uncomfortable and they rather just try to avoid even thinking about it because it's just so many question marks in the air and so little few answers and actually so few people really helping you because it's very difficult. Um, um, but then again, let me remind you also something that I learned uh, at uh, Tony Robbins seminars, uh, the, the Wheel of Life. Um, there, there is- my wife, my wife loves Tony Robbins, so- I've, I've, I love him. I've been uh, uh, Cliff, this moment. Marina, this is for you, honey. We're, we're talking, we're, she's not on the show, unfortunately. She's walking around the streets of Zurich, but this is the Marina Scrantz moment. We're gonna talk about Tony Robbins. Florian, go. <laughs> I've been many times with Tony Robbins. I, I volunteered, I think, six, six times for the the fire team at Unleash Your Power within, and I've done the date with destiny where I decided to put love first, and three months later I run into my wife, and it was love on the first sight. So, uh -huh. um, and since then we are ma happily married and have two children, and, and, and everything's good. So, I, the the point I was just making is that Tony had the, has this beautiful uh, concept or theory of the wheel of life. So your part, your life basically has six or eight different areas that are really essential to you. And one is obviously health. So you need to take care of your body and yourself. One is obviously a spirit, spirituality. You need to have some form of a connection with a higher consciousness, higher self, whatever it is, if you believe in God or, or in something else or not, but you need to have that kind of component clear with you. And that's actually where you can also get strength from. Yeah, relationships, friendship is very important. The career is important. There's a few things, self-development, and one part is finances. You can, you can be the nicest person, but if you don't have money in the bank, you're gonna have a shitty life experience at some point because you need money, it's that simple. And it's nothing that is bad about it. Um, 
So, uh, and people often then, because out of this being overwhelmed with all these things happening, they then decide like, I don't care about finances or money is stupid or only the bad guys have a lot of money. I think it's a completely wrong attitude and um, it's, it's good. Actually, I think it's, it's our, our duty to to become as abundant and wealthy as possible in this life because the more good you can do. So um, um, I, I think, uh, it, I understand that it is overwhelming uh, as the financial markets, especially in the last 20 years, because back in the 80s and 90s, it was easy to hold, uh, buy and hold stocks forever. You could also buy and hold bonds forever. It was very easy world. Nowadays, everything's up and down. Every, every few quarters, you have a big crash again. Then they lower interest rates. And, and it, it, it's so much things going on all the time. It's overwhelming. I totally understand it. So out of all this, I try to keep um, Midas Touch and our research as easy, accessible as possible. If you want more, if you want to work close with us, yes, there is a consulting uh, option that then has to be paid. But um, the, the basic research that we publish is free and is being sponsored by a company usually. And we currently so work together with a silver miner mm -hmm. um, from Canada and we work together with Genesis Mining in the crypto uh, uh, sector. And we have a few other partners like the chart that I present here, Celtic Gold, who is a, a gold dealer here in the Eurozone, mainly focusing on, on actually uh, Ireland, Ireland and the Eastern countries in Europe, but also uh, in, in Germany, mm. uh, they do good revenues and have a great offer. So yeah, that's how basically the model of Midas Touch. Got it. And I'm looking at your website right now. I see the Midas Touch Gold model. So uh, you know, when we when we post the show notes for the show, we're going to include links to all of this. Um, it's interesting. The you know we do have two of our yeah, maybe, speakers. Go, go ahead, please. Go ahead. Maybe just let me add to, because you mentioned the gold model. So that's for example something that I developed over the years, um, um, where I put together lots of different perspectives on the gold market. So. Um, Maybe I can share this if I get this now. And you know what? My, my garbage truck is coming down the street and it's loud. So I'm going to close my door for a second. Give me a moment. Okay. So uh, the, my main idea, or basically that's also one of my strengths probably because I'm coming from music. So I did not study financial markets. I'm rather very open-minded. Okay, I'm back. And, and always searching for principles and truth. The Midas Touch... Gold model basically is an approach that you look at the gold market from as many different angles as possible. So I believe that should be a general approach whenever you look for truth. Mm -hmm. So a real truth seeker will speak to all the different parties trying to understand their perspective on something and figure out that there is not one ultimate truth, but there is different perspectives. And most of the time you will tr find truth somewhere in the middle, right? So if, if there is a big... Uh, uh, divorce going on and you mm. talk to both uh, men, and, uh, men and women and then she will tell you her story and he will tell you his story and then you have already an idea that mm, probably it's not only his or her fault somehow both most of the time made some mistakes sure. then you start talking to their best friends mm. and suddenly you get another perspective on it if you then interview the neighbors maybe they give you a totally different perspective if you listen to the children or the parents yeah, you see, that's basically the, 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 the Midas Touch Gold model where I look at technical analysis, I look at sentiment analysis, I look at uh, seasonal uh, analysis. So there are certain seasonal cycles. You know this from Bitcoin as well. Usually mm -hmm. there is a strong time until the summer months in Bitcoin and then there is rather a weak time that we're just going through. Um, gold has a actually pretty strong uh, seasonal um, cycle. You notice also the famous saying, sell in May and go away from the stock markets. Mm -hmm. um, you can apply things like this are statistically proven uh, on the existing on the gold market. You look at these ratios that we talked about already today. So there is the gold silver ratio. You look at the Dow Jones gold ratio. You look at the ratio gold against oil price, for example, which is very important. You can also look at gold against a basket of different commodity prices, which gives you good information regarding uh, how inflationary is the environment right now. Mm -hmm. uh, you can look at gold stocks and how they behave. You look at the US dollar, obviously, which is an important part. You look at the, uh, the, the, the futures markets, so where the big money is playing and where they're doing their hedges and big bets. Mm -hmm. um, that's a very important part of it. 
uh, that's called the commitment of trades report, which is now also getting more and more interesting for Bitcoin because uh, the big players, that's where it's happening basically. And there's a few other uh, factors that I put basically into that model. And um, um, it's great. It has, uh, has a lot of, uh, it's a lot of formulas basically and um, takes out that kind of like second guessing and you're just quantitatively measuring what's going on in the market. And as it looks at so many different angles, you get a really good picture about what's mm -hmm. really happening. So that's, for example, the, 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 the Midas Touch Gold model that I developed over the years. I don't publish it too, too often anymore because it's just so much work um, to, to put this in a form that everybody can, can read it and see it. But um, I'm going to share just so people know what I'm talking about here. Um, just go through a few multiple screens here. Um, where is, where is it? So I need to Did yep. you see it? Yep. So that's the Midas Touch Gold model. Um, I just copied it from, from the website because I didn't have the window open. But you can see there's a lot of things going on, a lot of formulas. It's really big, big time Excel uh, things happening in the background. Um, and that helped me tremendously to understand the gold market uh, better. And now I have basically conditioned myself automatically look at all these things. But in the beginning, like 10 years ago when I started to put this together, mm -hmm. uh, I, I basically developed a routine and a system. It's a systematic approach to the gold market. And it, it, it has very good results and helped me a lot. And um, so that's one thing, for example, that I developed over the years. And, it's um, interesting. Yeah, I'm going to use this opportunity to bring in my, my friend and Excel jockey <coughs> and modeling whiz, Marco, because I'm, I'm pretty sure he's eating this all up. Um, <laughs> I, 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 I can give us the shortest view from the Caymans. Yes, you are. Mar for, for just you know, Marco is in the Cayman Islands. He has a tradition of showing up on the shirt, on the show shirtless, uh, just to rub in our faces. Not just how warm and wonderful the weather is there. Uh, Sergey, if you're over there, why don't you take yourself off mute and go on live video also? Uh, Sergey's yeah, a buddy me from. <laughs> Yeah. So, um, but it's hey, okay. Good to see you. Um, you know, collaborator, friend from the Eastern sphere, if you like. So Marco, let's just kind of start off with you. Just give us some thoughts, impressions. Just tell us what you think. The direct questions to Florian. Well, uh, like. uh, I'm, I'm, I'm very impressed <clears throat> by the, um, the removal of the U S dollar from your analysis. I think that's uh, spot on, uh, an excellent way of looking at all the markets out there because as we are well aware, um, the U.S. dollar has been in a, shall we say, a trusted guardianship over the world markets for decades now. And it's, especially recently, not performing in a very polite way, shall we say. Um, I am uh, uh, surprised to find that the Fed is uh, not looking as uh, bad as the as the Euro community in terms of balance sheets. That was uh, interesting, but I'm wondering if there's any skewing there because you based it on GDP, and I'm not sure one can necessarily trust GDP uh, results from any given government, um, much like one can't really trust the unemployment figures. Uh, it's all in how you calculate them. Uh, but that said, uh, I think the core thing that we're talking about here is that people uh, as a, a mass, I would say, buy into the, uh, the notion of inflationary currency because it's easy. And they don't tend to think about the idea that a dollar today is worth more than a dollar tomorrow, just fundamentally in, uh, in a uh, currency model uh, based on inflation, uh, your buying power drops over time, which is your motivation to spend. And one of the reasons why inflationary currencies are useful is, uh, is that they are a way of controlling the economy by incentivizing spend versus save. <clears throat> the minute you bring gold in, you're incentivizing save versus spend if you're using gold as a base money, uh, which 
from an economic manipulation standpoint is a problem from a personal experience of life based on your earnings is usually the way most people want to go. They want to know that they're going to have more money tomorrow than they had today. And in your question earlier, Gordon, when you were talking about, you know, taking 25% of your portfolio and tossing it into gold, mm -hmm. um, as I mentioned in the chat, that's insurance. That's literally insurance. The gold will likely go up in value, so you will get some economic benefit out of it. But the real point is, is you're giving up the ability to play with that money and possibly make more money with it in favor of saying, I'm going to pay that oppor lost opportunity cost in order to know that if the entire rest of my portfolio falls to pieces, I still have 25% of it that is actual real uh, value that I can turn into food and shelter. Right. Think of it as your own personal unemployment insurance or bankruptcy insurance, if that uh, makes any sense. It, it makes sense. I was questioning the, and I, I don't think Florian was quite going here. I think I maybe overinterpreted the, I was questioning, taking 25% of your assets off the table year in and year out, or not off the table, but off a certain table, year in and year out, and foregoing all the cumulative return that that can generate over, over time. I'm not, I'm not making an argument that the stock market's awesome or the US dollar is awesome, but there's a lot of people who keep on waiting for the dollar to crash. There's a lot of people who keep on waiting for China to fail. There's a lot of people keep on waiting for the world to wait, end up out of food. There's a lot of people waiting for a lot of things. And the fact that we're all here on Zoom, talking from different corners of the planet, with our lights on and internet working is evidence that that stuff never quite happens yet. And I don't know. He, 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 I've had a lot, you know, I've, I've been from, from a nice diversity of friends from the far left to the far right. And I don't, I, I'm willing to talk to anyone and I don't shut anyone down because of their politics, which offends some other people with their politics. But, but my, my conversations with the more rightward leaning survivalist, you know, accelerationist types, you know, they, at, at some point, their wives get sick of it. You know, it's mostly the guys. At some point, their wives get sick of living in the woods. And I'm like, you know, civilization hasn't fallen yet. Can I get my new Tesla? So, right. you know, I'm, I'm, I'm obviously I'm in this field for a reason. I'm in Bitcoin for a reason. I'm in all this stuff for a reason. You and I are working together and stuff, I'm working with Sounder and stuff. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't, I don't, I'm just cautious about gold and precious metals when they're not being used in a trading or EFT functionality just because you're leaving because it's a static asset it's not, not not a dynamic enterprise so i was just kind of poking at the percentage maybe allocation but go ahead ah, I, and that's true i mean florian did make a really good point um earlier about the the the, the dot-com bust probably would have been a great time to do it uh the financial crisis uh which was really the real estate crisis uh would have been an awesome place to do it um was to let everything fail and start from scratch. It's the, the, and this is fundamental conservatism, right? You don't want to watch the whole system crumble and then start from scratch with ideally a better system or at least one that, you know, has taken the lessons learned from the previous uh, reign of, uh, of standards and said, no, those don't work and let's build something new. It's, it's a terrifying thing for anybody to contemplate the idea that you might have to go uh, a couple of months without power while the world resets uh, or you might not have great internet connectivity for a few weeks while Actually, the world Mar resets. Mar 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 let, me, let me break in one second. The, the funny thing is, it, like Florian, you mentioned long-term capital as like the debacle moment. I, I remember the bailout of Chrysler as sort of like the debacle moment with Lee Iacocca and everything else. You know, like a little bit before, like the idea that this third largest automaker was going to fail and it's the job of the U.S. government to step in and fix it. it was highly controversial at the time, and to, to me that you know that supposedly they paid it back and more and yada yada yada. But you know the, this government providing not guaranteeing not only functional markets but the, the functionality of players within that market. I think there's been nudges of that for a long time, but you know 
for me, like Chrysler led to the long-term capital, which leads to all this other stuff. I want to point out though, that when companies fail, that doesn't mean that their assets are destroyed. So, you know, to take Marco, to take your example, you know, if Pacific Edison, you know, where I am, you know, if, if that company goes bankrupt, maybe there'll be a financial reason for the lights go off, but that doesn't mean the power plant blew up. So, you know, there, there is, there is a place for chapter 11 bankruptcies. There is a chance for paying off the creditors, wiping the shareholders and, and rebooting the enterprise. So those kind of resets are not necessarily so hardcore as the lights going off. So, to, to it go depends on, on which side you are. No? I mean, I'm, I'm obviously on the investor side and I would lose all my money in such a case. <laughs> so um, you can, if you talk about the perspective from the asset itself, okay, somebody else can then buy it for, for pennies on the dollar and somehow it will continue. But me as an investor, I invested in that stock or in that company or in that project, I might lose everything. So I think that's a very important point we need to see. Um, I no, just, no doubt, but doesn't that make you more activist in your selection of what you're investing in and how it's being run? If you know that there's not a governmental safety net underneath it, it, doesn't, it does. doesn't it create moral hazard if it, you think that your bad choices are gonna be socialized? That's one of the problems that we have these days that basically um, the losses are get socialized and the gains are privatized, right? That's one of the things that's happening in the European Union, for example, constantly. Yeah. And, and, and it's a nightmare. It's called Greece. Nobody, nobody is learning the lesson. Yeah. You don't let the free market really act and do its job, which would be wiping out all these motherfuckers, I have to say that word, because they run the company badly. They usually take the money in their own pockets, all these CEOs, and they do a bad job. And when it's time to be, take responsibility, they are all far away and suddenly the taxpayer have to pay for everything. And that's, that's not a good concept. And it is all related with this wrong money system that we are in. I strongly believe that that is the main reason. And I just wanted to mention that I agree with everything that Marco said, and I wanna thank you for the contribution you just did. Um, I think it's great. Um, I, we can, we, I couldn't, uh, I mean, it's really, you're totally right. You nailed it. And I, I put this chart here, the two, Dow Jones gold ratio, this is the last 200 years where you compare stocks against gold, basically. And you can see the, in the middle, right in the middle, there's this, this separation line, the red one. Mm -hmm. That's basically when the, fa the Fed was created, the Federal Reserve Bank in America. And it is very important to understand that this is a private bank founded secretly uh, on Jekyll Island in 1913 by five private banks. I read and that so book too. They took, yeah, <laughs> so there it is, I took this book out because this is so important. It's yep. a German version. Edward Griffin, the creator of Jekyll Island, which explains all these kind of things that happened over the last 107 years now. You can relate the two world wars to that event. You can do a lot of things finding out that since then we are living in a basically a fictive kind of economic system. Yes, mm -hmm. we had after the second world war, we had uh, for, for I think two decades or two and a half decades, we had the Bretton Woods system, which was rather a good system. But since 71, the world is on a paper party, on a confetti party. There's no backing of anything. They're just expanding the balance sheet. Whenever there's a problem, they create more currency out of thin air. And mankind has completely lost ground. We are not connected with nature anymore. We are not connected with discipline or the consequences or responsibility anymore because of that fact. Huh? It, it is highly never, related. Never, never be growing like that. We're talking today about destroying our planet. But why is that? Because nobody cares anymore. It's just, who cares? What the fuck? Okay. Companies bankrupt. We killed the forest, whatever. Let's print more. You know, that's what it is. That's the consequence. And that's where we are today. And we need to change this. And I think that's definitely the idea that Satoshi had when he created Bitcoin in 2008 and nine, that um, he wanted to change that. And this is an underlying problem and it will not go away until one day we will have a reset. And you asked this question already before. I don't know how it exactly will play out. There are certain ways you can see, for example, when we talk uh, precious metals, um, the, the Germans have been buying a lot of gold over the last 20 years. Uh, the, uh, not the, the German officials, the government, but the, the private people like me, normal people, um, because we have heard all these stories about hyperinflation from our grandparents. But if you look at China, there is not one ounce of silver and gold leaving the country for the last 20 years. And now they are the biggest gold and silver producer. 
and there's a big uh, part in culture, in the Chinese culture. Gold and silver is very important for them. You will see a lot of stores and shops over there. And I think the Chinese are trying at some point to back their Huan with gold and silver at some oh, point. Sure. Maybe it's going to be an electronic version, and maybe it's a, a type of crypto version, who knows, but they will need gold and silver to get the confidence of the rest of the world because none of us is trusting Chinese money at the moment. Um, the Russians are also, the, 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 the Central Bank of Russia is, is publishing this, this on a weekly and monthly basis. They're buying gold like crazy for many, many years already. You can see the reserves are going up all the time. And we know here in Switzerland are all the refineries. The reports are clearly showing that all the gold and silver are moving from the west to the east. And in, in America, yeah, people slowly but surely waking up and are also now starting to buy gold and silver. Normal people like, like, like we here are. Central banks still not willing to publish any audit of the gold reserves, the American gold reserves in, in, in Fort Knox. This is like 50 years already. We have not heard about new uh, updated numbers. And many countries like Germany, for example, started to repatriating their gold that have been in gold. They tried. I think, I think the Fort Knox actually refused. Right, they tried, so the Venezuelan- I think they turned, I heard they turned Fort Knox into a data center and they were mining Bitcoin. Guys, let me make sure, Sergey, I want to give you a wave. I want you to say hello. Yes, yes, yes. Hello, everyone. You know, actually, uh, I just put my, I know how I'd say, five cents or 20 cents about Russian economy. I don't know who and Please. for whom and who is personally buying a lot of gold from all over the world. But to be frank, actually, what I see, what I feel, that the economic situation in Moscow particularly is goes worse and worse from every and every day. And we see the dollar price, yes, BS rubble. Rubble price is the highest on the history, the highest on the history at this moment. I'm talking about today, I'm talking about now. That's why I don't feel that this kind of gold, of gold buying or gold engagement to the one place somehow be helpful for, uh, I don't know, for make economic situation in country much more better or just a little bit more better. That's why I know I see that everything is very special and very interesting happening with the dollar here. I, I, I see on the screen, I, I see on this, I don't know how I'd say, I see on the statistic or something else, but I, I want to understand how do we people, how do we common people some, how be, can be engagement in this process for making happen finally or ruin this economy or making something good special comes around, come arise. That's why for me it's very interesting. I'm a bit more engaged in crypto industry. That's why I'm sorry. I can't understand all of the stuff. Uh, I don't know, going in with, with fiat. That's why I'm really sorry. But, but for me, it's really very interesting. And I'm really, I don't know, be happy to understand how it looks like around the hundred of years in a row. Yes, I think you made, made a good point. I mean, if you or if people in Russia would have put their rubles into gold a few years ago, they would be much better off right now than if just uh, relying on the, on the paper money of ruble. But um, I, I understand that usually you guys talk more about crypto here, but my goal really is that-, that It's all related. Is, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, and my goal really is to bring these two different sectors more together because the crypto people usually are more younger guys. They don't want to look too much into the history or they just are overwhelmed with programming and coding and then you come with 5,000 year old history of gold and they will tell you, what do you want with this old school boring gold? And the gold guys will come to me and say like, what the heck, this is virtual, I cannot touch it, it's, what is this? And it is, doesn't make sense. You want to have both. And I believe, especially in a crisis like you're experiencing in Russia, in which I believe we all will sooner or later experience in, in the Eurozone, in America, everywhere on this planet, with gold and silver and at the same time Bitcoin and maybe a few other of the cryptos, uh, you will have a much better time and you can basically save your hard earned money uh, outside the system. And then once the reset happens and we don't know, and that's where we basically were just talking about, we don't know exactly how this reset will happen. It could be basically everything, the, the, the confidence of the people implodes. That's what happened in the hyperinflation in Germany because the perception of more trillions and billions here and they create more over there and every country is doing it at some point, the normal people in the street just don't believe in it anymore. The inflation expectations are rising. 
And that's where you then really get into this hyperinflationary spiral. We are not there yet, but it looks like it just takes a few more years probably, and it's building already. So the fact that we are talking about all this is part of it already. We are on the road already. And they cannot get out of this game. They have to print more. So um, that we will have some form of reset. If it's a hyperinflation, people lose complete confidence, then it will be a question, who will have the power to come up with a new system? Will it be a milita military taking over in many countries? Or is there still a, a valid government in China and Russia and America and Eurozone that sit together on a table and then it will be who has the most gold? Or in between maybe Bitcoin has become so expensive and I believe if it's above 100K or probably above 500K, Bitcoin will take over because people just don't trust and believe anymore in, in, in the normal paper fiat currencies like Euro or US dollar. Mm -hmm. And then politicians won't be able to collect taxes anymore. And then it's a complete explosion and chaos. I don't know. It could also be that tomorrow or in, in a year from now, they force us to use a new electronic form of money. And if you don't uh, uh, do this, you end up in jail. This is also very likely to happen. Um, we heard already this kind of measurements are being taken in Russia. So they, they, they drastically um, strengthened uh, the, the regulations against Bitcoin. And, 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 and I don't know about you, but my immediate mo emotional reaction to that is F off. For my French, fuck off. You know, whenever I hear someone telling yeah, you that. Say, say, like, say that to a guy with an AK-47 in your face. Uh, so long as he works for me. I, my goal is to have that guy work for me. <laughs> Okay. Right. Exactly. And, by, and by the way, just to serious point, I'm, I'm I'm looking at the U.S. dollar ruble change rate, and it around 77 rubles per dollar. Now it, it was 80 ish around, at the beginning of 2020. It's around 80 for this moment. Around 80, yes. Now, now it's around 80. The, 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 that's why it goes higher and higher every day, at least for from. Uh, one to, to from one to two point per day. It's really it's really crazy. I don't know what's happening in market, but all of, of the picture of the people around of the traders looking for making shorting in ruble vs dollar. Really, they are working on shorting at this moment. But actually, I, I'm eager to understand from Florian. He used multiple times talking about normal people. I I I, I think he he mean us uh, sitting around but when i'm personally for example yesterday going outside and looking for the normal people there i clearly see that we are insane really we are insane and we're looking for something special be happen on this market what, what do you think i think we are the persons who are making this history happen and who are should be the persons which are i don't know changing this world somehow for something fair in my point of view, because no one goes to change. If we're looking just for governments or for people around the globe, they already has their success and there is not, nothing to change. Nothing. They do not do something else to change the situation. The situation for them is already in success, but the situation for us is in a fail. That's why we are much more interested in something, something, something make uh, with situation happen. What do, you, what do you think about that? I am really very, very eager to know what do you do? What do you think? How do you can, I don't know, uh, make something interesting? I'm not saying, I'm sorry for my English. Maybe I don't find the right word to explain what I mean, but uh, what we It's okay, you're working on English, I'm working on my Russian. It's all good. Okay. Florian, did, did, you, <laughs> did you get what you needed out of that to answer or to it's, make a comment? I think the, the most important um, takeaway or answer to that is really, self-responsibility right i mean you every if if everybody on this planet would accept self-responsibility for the results in our own life and accept and believe also that we all each one of us has unique talents and 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 there's always something possible and you can always make something out of out of it and if you focus on the good things that's also very important because focus expands so whatever you focus on will expand and mm -hmm. the, Still a lot of opportunities and chances and the fact, for example, that we meet here together was impossible just a few decades ago. Now we even share charts and we bring each other on the same page. It's great. And these kind of things happen much more and more and more. And it is easy still to get and buy, especially if you are already a little bit in the, in the crypto industry. It is 
much, it, it is still easy to get Bitcoins in your own hands. It's still easy and possible to buy more gold and silver and store it and hide it away. And then, yeah, you come up with, with good business ideas. You can, you can make a lot of money just with the internet and a the notebook these days, but you have to stop listening to mainstream media. You have to stop uh, basically doing what everybody else is doing. And you have to stop to believe that with the same routine that you, I'm not saying to you personally, but in general, like believing with the same thing that you've been done over the last 10 years, creating new and different results is absurd. You need to change something. And I think all the tools are there. There's so many people willing to connect and work together. I mean, since the Corona crash, I have so many new people that I met in my life just with these mm -hmm. digital uh, uh, events all the time. It's unbelievable. I mean, I have more meetings than ever before. My business has been exploding over the last six months. Um, and it is because I always give from my heart. I do what I love. I'm passionate about it. And I, I believe in abundance and not in scarcity. And I don't turn on the TV and don't listen to all that crap. Um, and I, I, I used to, I mean, I use my own brain. We all have that, uh, 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 that function and we can all do this. But you need to think for yourself and you need to do the homework. You need to study. There's always. You just summarized Tony Robbins' personal power. <laughs> ten, 10 cassette tapes. You just summarized that in two minutes. <laughs> <laughs> and for a lot cheaper. I like it. All right, yeah. guys, we, we, as usual, we've run a little bit over our time just because it was such a good show. I, Sandra, I think because you were kind enough to bring Florian into the, the flock or us into his flock, you want to, as I like to say, land this plane? And wh yeah. where, where, where are you now? Are you still in the airport? You're back no, on the No, no, I'm, I'm in, a, in The Hague. In one of the local, um, I say hotels. Oh, same place. Was, okay, got it. I'll, yeah, I, got so uh, my connection was was a little bit uh, out. <laughs> I had to dial in for my phone, but I caught much of the much of the show. I really like it because there are a lot of things we have in common, and, and you see that also with the feedback that Marco gave when Flo and you you were talking about Tony Robbins. You know, these are all universal laws, and you know, you're self uh, responsible. This is where it all comes down to. So I think it was really valuable. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I would like to motivate everybody that was here and or was uh, watching the recording, join us next week. So we will publish uh, next week event and the next week speaker ASAP. We're finalizing uh, that, but also share the link from the YouTube channel. So we will upload it, let's say within the next couple of days or so, we will share it in our Telegram groups. But we would really value if not only the speakers, but also the attendees and the people that are watching the recording, please share it with, with your following. So we are building a community and this is like Florian said, and like Tony Robbins said, this is a mutual responsibility of everybody to uh, share out, uh, to bring out the, the, the word. So mm -hmm. I would like to thank, well, not only Florian, thank you for having some time uh, with us. I really appreciate always your opinion and our friendship also. I also would like to thank Diogo from Portugal, who was here also a little bit earlier, and Sergey, and also our good friend Marco. And Gordon, well, I think I can say on the both of us, we enjoyed the show. We're looking yeah, it's forward to it to next week's show. Uh, and like you said, this is not only about crypto or blockchain. This is like, you know, everything that has to do with business, future, life. taking responsibility, life, personal development. So that's, that's really good to get different opinions and insights. And I think what Glo uh, Florian shared with us today was really um, insightful. So thank you, Florian, for that. I look forward to seeing you again soon, maybe at, in one of the beer gardens in Munich so we can have a beer. Oh my God. And to <sighs> <laughs> no, uh, Gordon, you are also invited. Like I said, I know I'm invited. I need to. I need to get there. Damn it. Yeah. Ah. When, okay. when the desire is there, the, the how to will follow. We will find a way to get to to Europe. And I think this is a nice way of of bringing crypto community crypto Wednesday to the community. Yeah. Once we are able, of course, to fly and drive and, and so forth and so forth, then we can do li live events. Maybe this is a nice spin off of of whatever launched what was launched just a couple of months ago. And I'm really excited and, and happy to uh, to do that with you gordon and with all our friends um, so join us next week everybody florian you're also invited next week to join us step into the conversation like marco's always doing every week and we appreciate that marco so thank you for that we do um so we all wish you a good day stay safe stay healthy and we look forward to seeing you next week thanks guys thanks, thanks everyone really appreciate it still very thanks Bye. Thank you. and hey, just, just as an aside you can stop recording but uh we should